I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning, there's a couple of selections that Pastor Keith has chosen to be the basis of his sermon. The first is in the book of James, chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 13 through 17. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. While you do not even know what will happen tomorrow, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, It is sin for them. And then our second reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. And here we will be reading uh, verses 16 to 21. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. Let us be in prayer. Lord, you have given a message to Pastor Keith this morning to share with us. We just ask that it will just burrow its way into our hearts, that our hearts will be ready and prepared to receive it, and that Pastor Keith will just deliver it with the boldness and energy that you have given him to share it with this morning. Lord, we we take these words that we've read in Scripture this morning. We know that you are sovereign, that you have um, the plan for each and every one of us, and and we just need to pay attention to that and not rely so much on our own power and our own decisions. And so, Lord, we give ourselves up to you, and we just ask that uh, you will bless this time of teaching and that we will draw closer to you in all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. It's good to be back here with all of you. Did anybody come to Christmas Eve service here at the church? A lot, yeah. I don't. I didn't get the official count, but um, it was around like 1,500 people were here that day, and, and it was awesome. You know, it was a great morning in church when, uh, or a day in church when you start off saying good morning, just because you're used to doing that, even though it's two o'clock in the afternoon, right? And then by the time you train yourself not to say good morning after the 11 o'clock service, it actually is morning again. So, you you know, it's it's just awesome to come together to worship the Lord. And now we're at this 
sort of uh, what preachers call the limbo sermon, you know, the one between Christmas and the one between New Year's. And you go, what are you supposed to talk about there? Typically, preachers are gone that day as Mike is on vacation and he, of course, sends his blessing. He's in Atlanta at a uh, going to a bowl game for two teams. I don't even know who are playing in the Atlanta bowl game that he's going to, but he's just where it's warm and nice and enjoying himself. And he sends his greetings. But we're here to look back, of course, at 2014 and then prepare ourselves to move in. And so what did I do? As I, I preached the same sermon last, last year. So I, I just looked back. I printed off my sermon from last year. I thought, nobody's possibly going to remember all that, right? I could get away with just sort of mailing it in on, on you know, December 28th. Everybody's so just in a frenzy after Christmas. But I, I can't do that. It just, it just, I just couldn't do that. So I, I, have, I have some other uh, things to share with you. I mean, it's kind of the same idea, right? Because we all go through the same thing at the end of the year, right? I mean, for some of us, we are just trucking through 14. We can't wait to flip the calendar because maybe 2014 was some bad stuff. And we're like, okay, I'm ready for it to be 2015. For others of us, we're like hanging on for dear life because this was a great year. And maybe some things in 2015 we're not as sure about. So it's it's interesting because how do you evaluate a year? How do you know whether it was a good year or how are you supposed to, to look at that and, and make a make a comparison to the year before? Well, is it about what you accomplished or is it about what you didn't accomplish? Is it about what you did or is it about what somebody else did? Maybe for some of us in 2014, the year is is dominated by maybe what we lost or who we lost. Well, for others of us, it's about who we gained and who joined our family. You know, either way you slice it, 2014 was the best year ever and the hardest year ever, wasn't it? It all depends on your perspective, your point of view, and how you choose to look at it. So how does God want you to view 2014? You know, some of us are like, I'm all about changing everything. And others of us are all like, nope, keep everything exactly the same. Can you relate to that? Some of us love to change. Some of us hate it. But the fact is this, whether we love it or not, everything changes, doesn't it? Everything changes. So the title of my sermon this morning is Owning Your 2014, Growing Into Your 2015. So how does God want you to view this? Well, first of all, he wants you to own it. He wants you to own it. So what does it mean to own it? What does it mean to own a year. Well, basically it means that the good and the bad, you accept it. You stop trying to change what cannot be changed and stop pretending that things aren't changing. Stop trying to change what cannot be changed and at the same time stop pretending that things aren't changing because everything changes. We can try to stay the same, but it's a losing battle, isn't it? Life goes by, people grow up, things change. One of these days, I'm just going to have to own that I turned 40 in 2014. Oh, I just can't even stand saying that. I remember when my dad turned 40. That, he was old. I remember that. I was like, man, you're an old man. You know, 40 for crying out loud. It's just ridiculous. I'm trying to own that, but I'm struggling. I'll be honest with you, I'm struggling. We went to a party, Estelle and I, the, the other night that one of our friends was, was having. And we walked in and, you know, said hi to some people. And there were people drinking drinks and eating food and hanging out. So we, would, of course, were just enjoying ourselves with some friends and, and talking. And as we were leaving, we looked at each other and she looks at me and she says, you do realize that almost everyone at that party is half our age, right? And I'm like... Shut your face, woman. <laughs> no way. She's like, yeah. And then she starts naming off like all the people that were born after we got married. She's like, well, they're only this, they're only that. And I said, will you stop it? It's nine o'clock and I'm ready for bed. All right, just, just leave me alone. And we were like talking about this and I'm like, no, this, I was just like, I, I refuse to own that. So as we were driving home in the Prius, um, <laughs> this Justin Bieber song came on the radio and I cranked it up, rolled the windows down, and was singing it at the top of my lungs. Like, yeah, look at me. I refuse to own that, right? 
But I can't help it. Everything changes. 2014, for many of us, was a great year. For many of us, it was hard. You know, I'm watching my kids grow up right in front of my eyes. I remember when we moved to this church, that went in my fourth year here. And that doesn't seem like that long ago. Others, are, others of you are saying, you know, it's very long. Um, <laughs> like your sermons. But I look back at, like, pictures of our kids and our family when we first moved here. And, I, I mean, I'm just like, what happened? My daughter's 17 now. She's got a car and a job and a boyfriend. I'm okay with two of those things, right? (laughs) What is going on? How does this happen? And and there are times when I look at that and I go, I just want to freeze everything because I want everything to stop changing. You ever feel that way? But we can't, can we? We've got to own what happens. We've got to own and accept the way things are. What about you? What do you need to own about your life in 2014? What do you need to own that you did or that was done to you? Was it something that you regret? Was it something or someone that you lost? Listen, whatever happened in 2014 that cannot be changed must be accepted. You understand that? It must be accepted. It must be owned. Now, this is hard to do. It doesn't mean that you pretend that whatever happened that hurt you isn't real or it didn't happen. But it means that you learn to accept whatever it is and that it has changed reality and that things will not ever be the same again as they were. You know that that's the last stage of the grief cycle is acceptance. I don't know if you're familiar with the grief cycle, but a few years ago I had to go through some of that kind of stuff. And and the grief cycle is what psychologists have identified as the stages that all human beings experience when they go through a loss, a tragic loss. No matter what that loss is, we all go through the similar psychological, emotional response to it. And it begins with denial. It begins with, like, I disbelieve that happened. I, I just can't accept that. That didn't take place. And then we move from there into a period of bargaining with the universe. Oh, if only I would have done this instead of that, things would have been different. If only I would have turned left instead of turned right. If only I would have kept my big mouth shut. If only I would have not done this or done that. You ever do that? And then when we realize that our bargaining doesn't ever change anything, then we move into a period of anger. Anger at others or anger at ourselves or anger at the universe or anger at God for whatever it is that we're grieving. And then that moves into a period because anger takes so much emotion away from us and so much energy that we find ourselves, we find ourselves sapped of all emotion and power. So then we just become depressed and sad, oftentimes isolated. It's only after all of that fun stuff that we get to the last stage, which is acceptance. Notice there's no stage where it's like everything goes back to the way it used to be and everything's great. No, that's not the way the world works. The last stage is acceptance, when you stop living in a false reality and you own whatever your new reality is. That's what we have to do with 2014. We've got to own it. Own it whether it was awesome or own it whether it was horrible. We've got to recognize what it was and accept it for reality. Now, after we own it, the next thing that we have to do is grow from it. We have to grow from it. And and I I saw this quote again. I think it was earlier this year. I don't remember exactly where I was, but it it was one of those quotes that that I read that just kind of hit me. I went, wow, that's deep. And it was by a guy named John Maxwell, who's this leadership guru kind of guy. He's also a pastor. And And he wrote these words. He said that change is mandatory. Growth is optional. Let that sink in for a second. Change is mandatory. Growth is optional. You can't stop change from happening. I can't stop change from happening. I can't stop the world around me from from doing what it's going to do. Change is mandatory. But whether or not we grow from it is completely optional. You don't have to. You can stay exactly the same in your own mind and and try to just to, to repeat those behaviors or those patterns or whatever it is. Or you can grow. But really the choice is yours. And I think that Jesus wants us to grow.
from whatever took place in 2014. He wants us to grow from the things that went well and from the things that didn't go so well, from our successes and from our failures. He wants us to grow. I want to talk to you for a minute first about how to grow from your success. That's important that you that you think about it that way, because a lot of people don't. A lot of people think that when you've achieved something, you've been successful, that you've arrived and and therefore you don't need to change. You don't need to grow because you've already done what you wanted to do. So you just get stuck there. Right. Listen to this text from from Jeremiah chapter nine. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this. That they have the understanding to know me. That I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. What he's saying is that when you have success and you turn that success onto yourself and you inwardly boast and you say, Oh, well, I'm awesome. Look what I did. I'm the greatest ever. Then you're headed for trouble. Then you're headed for trouble. I have a good friend of mine who, who started a business a few years ago, um, and we get together and we talk about business stuff and, 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 and entrepreneurial things or whatever, and, and he said, Keith, did you know that most businesses fail on the way up? Most businesses fail while they are experiencing success. Did you know that? And I said to myself, I don't understand that. Why? But then we began to think about it and we began to to dive into it. It's because when you're experiencing some success, you start to 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 either do one of two things. You you feel like you can either do no wrong. So you just kind of keep doing the same things that you're already doing. Right. Or you just take the foot off the gas and you just coast because you think, hey, I've arrived. Right. I've arrived. I've done everything I need to do. But it's while most of us are on the way up. That things already start to fall apart because there's nothing more damaging to your success in anything that you're involved in, whether it's your business, your family, your academics, your faith, anything, your relationships. There's nothing more damaging to that, to your success than to pride. Because as soon as you start to believe that you're the reason why the success happens, it begins to fall apart. And by the time it does, oftentimes it's way too late. You see, another uh, business thing that I, that I read recently talked about this, said innovate or die. Innovate or die. Meaning that whatever you're doing, you've got to constantly be reinventing yourself and changing things up and finding new ways to do what you want to do to be successful. It's so true, isn't it? But if you don't grow from your success, you will become stagnant and you will stop and the world's going to keep changing and everyone around you is going to keep changing and you're just going to keep doing the same old thing, wondering why it's not working anymore. See, some people, they became Christians. They, they prayed a prayer or, or went to a camp or did something and, and that was their moment with Jesus and they thought, okay, I'm a Christian now, I'm good, Right? So they just kind of hung out in that place. They didn't keep growing. They didn't keep studying. They didn't keep praying. They didn't keep giving. They didn't keep evangelizing. They didn't keep serving. And I've seen it a thousand times and you have too. Their success, short-lived, became a failure. Because they didn't grow from it. So when something great happens in your life, celebrate it. Own it. But don't allow it to paralyze you. Or to puff you up with pride. Instead, rather, let it draw you closer to the arms of Jesus, who will take you and and continue to bless you and grow you through your successes. Now, of course, some of us go, well, I haven't had any successes in a long time. I just have a lot of failures. You know, the chances are both of we all have both. Some things we succeed in, some things we don't. And I think what Jesus wants us to do is to own our failure and to grow from our failures too because even the most successful people in 2014 had some failure too so grow from it right how do you do that you know maybe your failure was a a a business venture or an academic pursuit but maybe your failure was your family or a relationship 
or your faith or some moral failure or some unmet standard you put for yourself. And when you look back at 2014, you just go, oh man, what a failure. What a failure. I, I want to share with you Jesus' parting words in John chapter 8. I'm just going to tell you what they are. To, to, to this woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. She was caught in the middle of this sinful act and was hauled out by these, by these people. And they were ready to throw rocks at her until she would die for her sin. And when, of course, Jesus, and maybe you're familiar with the story, Jesus said, you know, the law says that we should stone this woman. What do you say? And they asked Jesus that question. He said, let he who has no sin throw the first stone. Well, one by one, these men dropped their rocks and walked away. And the woman was left there by herself with Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? And she said, they've all gone. He said, well, who is left to condemn you? She said, no one. He said, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Think about that. Think about what it means to hear the voice of Jesus speaking to your life about your greatest failure and say, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. Jesus doesn't take our, our failures and shove them in our face. Jesus doesn't take our failures and put us on the B team because of them and say, well, now you're not as good as you were. You're second class. Jesus says, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. He wants you to grow from that. It's not just enough to say, well, neither I do I condemn you. Just keep doing what you're doing. Don't change. Don't own it. He didn't say, oh, what you did wasn't really that big a deal. It's no problem. Don't sweat. No. She owned it. She owned it. And he forgave it. And then he gave her a mandate. He said, you've still got life to live. You've still got people to love. You've still got things to do. So go and live your life. Leave this garbage behind you and go into what I have for you. That's a message that I think some of us need to hear, don't we? It's a message we need to hear. Stop obsessing about your failures and move on. Stop worrying and being paralyzed by things that cannot be changed. Everyone fails, but not everyone grows from it. And God is a God of grace. However, that grace should not be wasted on self-pity or shame. It's a second chance, or a third chance, or a fourth chance, or a 972nd chance. Whatever it is that you need to be forgiven of, Jesus can forgive you, but you've got to grow from it. He doesn't want you on that endless cycle of sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, repent. If that's the cycle that you're on, then you need to recognize Jesus' words where he says, go and sin no more. But some of us never get that far because we just are so ashamed and inside of ourselves and punish ourselves so much because apparently the cross wasn't enough punishment. And we say, oh, woe is me. And Jesus says, now go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. Leave it behind. Leave it behind. You own it. You grow from it. And you leave it behind. You see, when we are still holding on to the way things were, either good or bad, then we are not free to embrace what God has for us in 2015, good and bad. It's like we have these arms that are stretched out and they can only hold so much. And God has so much to give you, but you've got to drop what you already have in order to receive what God has. You've got to leave it behind. You've got to leave it behind. What would your 2015 look like if you left the baggage of 2014 back in 2014? How freeing would that be for you? 
and encourage you to do that because we cannot waste our time here on this planet, can we? Because we don't know how much of it we have left, do we? And it doesn't matter whether you're young or whether you're old. We had a member of our church, 90 years old, die this morning. One of our members is going to bury his sixth grade niece who died yesterday in a hunting accident. Life is uncertain. We are not guaranteed anything except for what we have right now. What are you going to do with it? The answer is nothing if you don't leave behind 2014. I read earlier from James where, where he talks about this idea of, of, of how people make plans and how people decide what they're going to do and how oftentimes we can be guilty of, of, of presuming and, and expecting when the fact is this, we don't know. Therefore, we should be humble. We should say if it is God's will and, and we should seek to live our lives under God's sovereignty, not under our own plans and desire to, to do whatever we want to do. We should live our lives with hope, but not always with expectation. Does that make sense? I hope I have a great 2015, but I don't expect anything from God other than what His will is for me. I can't say, God, I expect to be successful in ministry and in business in 2015. I expect you to, to give me uh, health and wealth this year. I expect, God, for our church to quadruple in size because of our awesome sermon series that we're going to preach. Right? Be nice. I can't expect that from God because whatever God's will is. But I can hope. I can hope. And I can prepare my heart for whatever God wants to do in me. And, and so can you. Because I don't want to waste my time obsessing about past hurts and regrets or by coasting on past accomplishments either. I don't want to be the guy that's like, oh yeah, back in the day when everything was awesome. Insert boring story. And do nothing today. I don't want to be that guy. See, because if we do, Jesus tells us bad things are in store. You know, I read this parable from Luke 12 a minute ago about the man who, who has all this success and, and, and all these resources that he's accumulated. And he says, okay, I've done enough. I'm just going to coast the rest of my life on all my grain in my barns. We have our modern day uh, versions of that, don't we? There's nothing wrong with being retired from work, right? But you should never retire from the kingdom of God. You should never retire from the ministry of the gospel. And there's nothing wrong with saying, praise God, I've been a good, faithful steward of what I have. But there is something wrong with hoarding everything for yourself and not being willing to be generous toward God. But that's what happens when we refuse to own it, grow it. And, and prepare ourselves to leave it all behind. You see, we've got a great things to celebrate in 2014. We, as a church, we've seen so much increase. We've seen so much growth. We took a couple mission trips to Haiti. They were awesome. We've seen a lot of our ministries grow in their effectiveness. We've seen people come to Jesus, most importantly. It's been a great year. But I tell you what, we can't just sit back and coast through 2015. We've got to keep our eyes on Christ. And we've got to let go of whatever's behind us so that we can receive what he has. Now, what does he have for us? Let me just tell you a little bit of what I see kind of on the horizon. I, I, I see another mission trip to Haiti, by the way. This is my plug for that. March 13th through the 20th, okay? If you want to go on this trip, it's going to be a little bit different from the other trips. This trip's going to be a little bit more hands-on, like construction-y kind of stuff. And it's going to be uh, March 13th through the 20th. If you're interested, there's an informational meeting on January 11th. It's a Sunday night at Christ United Methodist Church in Davenport. If you, if you want to know more about that, send me a message or contact me. There'll be another trip probably in August. Mike's going on the one in March. I'm excited. It's going to be incredible. I, I see this 175th anniversary party that we're going to be having that's going to last a year long, right? And I think our committee that's working on that's careful not to let it just all be about the glory days of old, right? But about where we're headed and what God's got going on. And our, our, our first big event that we're going to have 
It's on January 28th. It's a Wednesday night. It's going to be called 412 hashtag premier. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be bringing all of our students from the Carnegie over and we're going to have a, a, a big worship youth experience in this sanctuary. And all of you are invited. The whole church is invited. I want to see this sanctuary like Christmas Eve packed to the gills with people ready to experience what our youth experience each and every Wednesday night. And I'm excited for you to come. But, but what I'm more excited about than the hundred or so kids that are going to be in here and probably more. What I'm more excited about than even you guys coming in here are are the parents of our students that will come that night. You say, wait a minute, isn't that the same thing? Aren't we the parents of our students? No. Did you know that most of the students that come to our our 412 on Wednesday nights, most of them, their parents don't go to this church or any church? Most of them don't have that. And I'm excited because we're cracking that door open and saying, all right, come and be a part of this. See what happens. Do you know that in 2015, we're going to bring into membership at least two that I know of in January, two young families who are entering the church because their high schooler brought them to church? That's exciting, isn't it? In 2015, we're going to continue with our our build program. We're going to keep moving toward what God has for us in the future because we know that we can't stay the same. As exciting as it is, we, we can't say, hey, we love having no parking in the middle of downtown Marion with, you know, all these struggles. We can't, we can't stay the same. Things are changing. And I'm believing, God, that by the end of 2015, we have a clear, short path to, to having an additional worshiping location for this congregation whether it's in a new building that we construct or in a building that we take over for a short time. But I think we need that. I think we need an interim space where we can have a group, a a congregation spring up from within this congregation to allow us some breathing room around here. Because it's a little bit tight, isn't it? I get here super early, so I don't have the park. park. When When I get here, there's plenty of parking, okay? I'll be honest with you. There's a couple of people from the 745 service that beat me here, all right? 645 in the morning, they're already lining up, right? I love it. 2015 is going to be amazing. We're going to see God do so many things. And my prayer for all of us is that our arms are wide open. Are wide open. And we won't be chained by our regrets. And that we won't coast or be prideful about our successes. That we'll say, if it is the Lord's will, we will do this or we will do that. That's our prayer. You need to do that for your own self and so do I. It's time to own all this stuff, to accept it, to grow from it, but then to leave it behind so that you can have what God wants you to have and do what he wants you to do and most importantly, be who he wants you to be. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, some of us in this room, God, are racing toward the end of this calendar. Lord, but I know that you will show us that Flipping a calendar doesn't necessarily mean a heart has been flipped. So, Lord, I pray today that all of our hearts are focused on you and that, God, we could just leave these past things behind and step into 2015 with a new resolve, a new resolve to seek you more, to to turn from our sin, to embrace your grace, to let it wash over us, to encourage and love each other, to be generous and serving. Father, I ask today that you would give us this spirit for who we are to be right now. And you'd show us our role to play in this world. And that you'd allow us, Lord, to be rich toward you, to know that we're covered by your grace, and that you've got an awesome plan, no matter what happens. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. Have a look at this video. Mary Methodist is special to me because of the people here and how welcoming it is. And you can always find something that you will enjoy. Some of my favorite experiences at Mary Methodist is being a part of the puppet troupe because you meet all sorts of people and we can go different places 
and it's all while still worshiping God and having fun. I choose to give my gifts to Marian Methodist because I know that the money or anything I give will come back and it will benefit everyone in the church. My name is Cindy Langith, and these are the reasons why I give to Marian Methodist. Will you please join me in worshiping God this way?